Hey, Sierra Frost from Invitation Wellness here. So today is day three of Naked in Public, which is me being completely vulnerable and raw and unedited and authentic. And today, a lot of people are talking about the topic of suicide. This week, a lot of people are talking about it. And the reason is because some more celebrities have completed suicide. Now, if I'm being completely vulnerable and raw and authentic, I will tell you that there's a part of me that feels frustrated by that. And here's why. So many of us, and I know many of you um, watching this live or, or recorded relate to this, so many of us have been touched by suicide, either in our own lives, feeling that way ourselves, or having lost a loved one on accident, on purpose, knowing, um, knowing people in our youth, and on, in all kinds of ways. And so part of me feels frustrated that it takes celebrities to start this dialogue at such a large scale. And then the other part of me doesn't care what it is that starts the dialogue. It's just important that it's happening. So, so that's, so that's the thing. It's so important that it's happening. Suicide is the number two cause of death for youth in our nation. Number two behind car accidents. We are losing our future and, and, and really valuable human beings to something that we can prevent. We can prevent that we could interact with differently and better. And that's the thing that, that sometimes I feel really frustrated about is that why aren't we taking the time and spending the money? Why aren't we dedicated to figuring out these skills? Because that's all they are is skills. You can spend eight hours taking a mental health first aid class with me or with somebody else and leave having much, much better skills and feel confident talking to people about topics of suicide and mental health and addiction, knowing how to identify and observe when things might be red flags, knowing and practicing specific language and ways to offer help to talk to people so that they can accept it, so that they can reach out, and knowing what to do in a crisis. Because here's the deal, most people have never said the words, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? And it's not because they haven't been in a situation where it would be appropriate to ask. It's because what if the answer is yes? What if somebody says yes to that question? Holy shit, what am I gonna do now? And that's what we need to figure out and what a lot of people know, but most people don't. And that's the problem. So this is why I'm talking about this today. I know for me, um, I've been suicidal several times in my life, uh, in my youth. I was suicidal when I was 12 and 13 for quite a while. And I attempted several times and luckily I was not good at it because I'm still here. And then in my adult life, I've also felt actively suicidal. And now I have a crisis plan. And I know that all I have to do is text two words and immediately a string of actions and people who have agreed to be there if I need support. And I've explained exactly what I need in that support will happen. That's extremely valuable, extremely valuable because I don't want to die and I don't want other people to die or to suffer or to feel the way that that feels. It is so lonely and heartbreaking to be in that space of believing that the only way out is to end our life. And it's so common. 
It is so common for people to feel suicidal, even if you don't have a mental health illness or challenge or don't feel like you're actively going to attempt or complete suicide, thinking something like, gosh, this day is really hard and crappy and shitty and gosh, what if I just weren't here anymore? That's a really common thing to think and to imagine that we don't talk about. Why aren't we talking about this? It's happening to so many of us. Um, and the fact is that the onset of mental health illness, meaning when people report feeling symptoms, 50% is by age 14 and 75% is by age 24. And we aren't diagnosing or catching or getting help sometimes into our 30s on average or 40s on average, depending on the illness. And there's a lot of factors that go along with that, but the biggest one that you and I could help with is stigma and having these conversations and figuring out how to have them in thoughtful ways and educated ways. And that's why I'm talking about this today. Every week, almost every week, you guys, someone reaches out to me and says that they're in crisis or that they have a friend in crisis and they need help figuring out how to support them. And I'm only one person. There are so many people out there who need help and I'm so happy to be there and to know these skills and to do that. I am confident and calm and absolutely sure that I know how to support people in mental health challenges and in crisis situations. And it's not because I am a licensed clinician or a therapist or I spent years of work in college doing this. I did not. It's because I decided I wasn't willing to stand for anybody else suffering any longer and I spent the time and I spent the money and I spent the energy to figure out how to be good at this. And you can do that too. You can absolutely do that too. I, I just... I just like, what, what else is more important that we would be spending our time and our energy and our money on besides letting people know that they're not alone and that there is hope? Because here's the deal. I personally believe that with any mental health illness, recovery is possible. And when I say recovery, I don't mean that we are not human beings anymore and we never have bad days or challenges or even that we never feel suicidal again. What I mean is that we learn skills to manage that so that it doesn't control our lives. That we have people in our lives that know how to support us, that we can ask for help more easily, that we have our own skills to be able to support ourselves. All of those things are possible. And, and part of it is getting through the stigma. The stigma of what if... I talk and someone judges me and tells me I'm a coward for even considering killing myself. What if someone calls me crazy or insane or OCD or bipolar because I like organization or whatever that is? That's so much shame. And you guys, shame is an intense feeling that really stops us from, from being able to be ourselves and to talk about things. And then we silence and we suffer in that silence. And I'm not fucking willing to put up with it anymore. So if you have a question, um, write it in the comments if you're live or if you're watching this recording because I want to start this dialogue. My intention of this video is not only to be raw and vulnerable and authentic and appreciate the pain that I have gone through and tell you about my own experience with complex PTSD, with being suicidal, with having addictions, but also to say... I'm willing to support you getting skills and to talk about this further. If you want to have a dialogue, if you want to take a mental health first aid class, let me know. Ask me questions. What's coming up for you? Um, medication is something that's really stigmatic. And, and the thing is, it's stigmatic both ways. If a person decides to take medication, it's, it's judged if a person decides they don't want to take medication, it's judged. I'm a big advocate for letting people know that there are many other options. I am very wary of understanding that with studies we don't know a lot about being on medication long term. And 
I'm a big advocate for saying it's your choice. You get to decide how your life goes. But as much as we are told that it's weak to be on medication, we're also told that you can't do it without it. And that's bullshit. If anyone tells you that you can't do something either way, that that's not supportive. That's not that's not believing in someone. What's supportive and what's helpful is letting people know that recovery is possible and it looks different for every single person. And for you, if it includes medication and that works and that's helpful, cool. And for you, if it doesn't and it isn't something you want to be on forever and you want to learn how to figure out how to be off of it, then cool. You should try and do those things and, and be educated and ask people and ask resources and read books and go to professionals and figure out what that looks like. And you should have friends who are there to support you and check in and make sure that you're safe and, and be there with you along the way because that's what you deserve. Suffering in silence is not something that I stand for anymore. And I haven't st stood for it for a while which is why I decided to prioritize my time and my money and my energy to figure out how to support people. And that's what I am just flat out calling you out on right now. Have you done the same thing? And are you willing to have this conversation? Are you willing to be brave enough to ask questions? Are you willing to be brave enough to figure out how to support the people around you? Because I guarantee someone in your life has a mental health illness, has a mental health challenge, has felt suicidal. If it's not you, it's somebody else. Someone you know and someone you love. Ellie says, how do we talk to family members who don't really understand our struggles and pain? Yeah, great question. Um, well, part of that is are they willing to have a conversation? Like, can you go to them and say, I would really like to describe this experience and what it's like for me and are you willing to be open to just accept me letting you know um, so that's number one because if they're not willing to do that they're probably not going to be able to hear it from you and and part of that is them protecting themselves part of that is not necessarily that they're thinking oh I don't want to love you and I don't want to support you but them thinking oh my gosh, if this person that I really care about is feeling suicidal or is feeling very depressed, that's so painful for me to think about that even just subconsciously, not consciously, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start to push that away or not trust that that's it or force them into um, some form of treatment that I think is necessary. Um, so other considerations you could take if that's something that's happening is... Um, books, movies, speakers, other people who are talking about mental health, um, asking if they would be willing to take a mental health first aid class because you, not because, um, you don't have to tell them like, because I want you to learn how to support me better, but because I heard it's really, um, beneficial for the world and that everyone should be taking it. Um, Keep, keep talking to me about this, Ellie. Is this, is this helping? Do you have more questions about it? Um, if they are willing to listen to you, there's a lot of other, other ways to maybe describe things. So talking to them about what your experience is, is like, about very like physical struggles about um, not struggles but signs and symptoms like physically when I feel depressed sometimes you can tell because it's really hard for me to take a shower so if I haven't taken a shower for three days it would be helpful if you just check in and say hey how are you doing um, sometimes when I feel anxious I kind of freeze or like do that thing where I'm kind of looking off in the distance like this but I'm not really present like I'm just kind of checked out and that's what anxiety looks like for me and so if you see me doing this can you just ask me let them know if you if you're concerned about me I really want you to just ask me directly are you feeling depressed or are you thinking of killing yourself give them permission to show up in that way um, you can make a list of things that 
are helpful to do, activities that are helpful to do, um, foods that are very comforting for you, smells that are comforting, blankets that are comforting, um, specific phrases that you want to be asked. And this is part of uh, creating a crisis plan. So again, you guys, if that's a, a training that you would like me to provide, just let me know in the comments because I think having a crisis plan is a really big deal and uh, something that I'm really good at creating and I would be happy to help facilitate that for people to have. Um, because the reality is if someone is feeling in crisis, it is almost impossible to really reach out well. And everyone, wants different things. What I want when I'm in crisis might be different than what you want or what somebody else wants when they are in crisis. And so it's important to know very specifically what it, what that is. Um, so, oh, the other part of that. So when someone is in crisis, we want to make it as easy as possible to reach out. So for example, I don't know if I said this or not already, but my crisis plan is is so accessible that all I have to do is text two words to some people and then there's a whole bunch of actions for up to a week that I need for support that go immediately into play with people who I've asked and they've agreed to be on the crisis plan and be supportive of me. So it's it's important also that you ask permission for people because if you don't if you don't feel like you can um, support someone yet in that space it's okay what's not okay though is to agree to it and not really be certain so don't say yes until you, unless you are certain that you feel comfortable and able to support them and if you are the person who wants to have a crisis plan make sure you have several people on it because we can't rely on just one or two people. That's not fair because what if they're not available? What if they have other things going on? Like no one of us has time all the time to drop everything. Although if someone did uh, text you and say they were in a crisis and feeling suicidal, I think you should drop everything um, and figure out how to support them even if that's uh, calling or texting someone you know like me or a crisis hotline. Um, the crisis hotline is 1-800-273-TALK, 273-8255, I think. So if that's not in your phone, put it in your phone right now. Um, and they are there not just for um, the person who might be feeling suicidal, but if you know of someone or you aren't sure what to do, call them and ask them because they will have resources and they will be able to help you. Um, Ellie says, some members are willing. They want to know how to help. I referred them to books, articles. Yes, okay, great. I really encourage that. I think that's beautiful because sometimes it's easier to hear about these concepts from someone that you don't know directly because it takes away that idea of, oh my gosh, this is my loved one and I'm really uncomfortable um, even imagining that they feel this down or maybe it's it's a feeling of this is my fault, like my, my spouse is feeling suicidal. I must not be a good spouse or a good mother or a good father or a good brother or a good sister or a good parent because my loved one is feeling this way, um, which is not true, but it's a very human feeling. I told them I need community, I need to feel accepted and not isolated and judged. I honestly want to keep talking about it. Yeah, okay, so what does that look like for you to have community and to be accepted and not isolated and judged? Is it inviting you to have tea or coffee on a regular basis? Is it... Um, coming up with some sort of language, like asking you on a scale of zero to 10, um, how much are you feeling challenged today? And knowing like if it's above a seven um, to, to check in every day for a few days or to keep inviting every day for a few days. Is it to um, spend physical time with you, but not have to talk? Like sometimes, uh, I know for me and a lot of other people or clients that I've had, um, when they're feeling anxious or, or depressed, it's like we want to be with people, but we don't want to have to, we don't have to, we don't want to have the pressure of needing to interact. So uh, sometimes I could ask a friend, like, are you willing to come over and just sit next to me? And we could, you know, be doing different activities or maybe... I'm working or doing art and they're knitting or writing or watching a movie or like we were together but not necessarily engaging and that can be really supportive. Um, 
do you need to feel supported with food like I know that a lot of people it's it's hard to take care of our hygiene and and things when uh when we're feeling really down especially if it's been happening for a while and by the way depression is defined by um feeling depressed for at least two weeks and it getting in the way of our everyday activities so in the way of us working or showing up for responsibilities or um supportive and uh, fulfilling social relationships if we're not doing that in the way that we normally do that that is what mental health illness is um so food is what I was saying Um, For me, I know when I am in a really down space that I stop eating. It's just something that I do. I don't feel hungry anymore. It's really hard for me to get up and have the energy to do that. So, and I also sometimes don't want to eat with other people. It just, for whatever reason, it creates anxiety for me. So having somebody bring me food without the pressure of having to eat it but knowing that it's there later on when I'm alone is really really helpful if all I have to do is like heat something up or just take it out of the fridge because it's brought to me and it's made I am much more likely to eat than having to prepare something for myself or or feeling like I have to eat in front of or with somebody else because ultimately you guys the 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 amount of shame that goes along with mental health and addiction is part of that is that's what it is for people and so having being seen in those moments can be really really hard and I think that's something that we could talk about more with our loved ones or with people who want to be supportive of these experiences is that the amount of shame happening makes us act and be very very different I know um in the past I've had friends be like well it's not that big of a deal why don't you want to just come to drop in volleyball or why can't you just go to the grocery store on your own because normally yeah that's not a big deal for me when I'm doing well but when I'm in a space of having a mental health challenge or feeling suicidal that's a completely different ball game a completely different ball game so um what I'm getting at, Ellie, is is the more specific we can be about what we need, the easier it's going to be for other people to show up. So being really, really um, considerate of, like, here's a list of foods that are comforting to me that you could bring me. Here's some music that really helps me um, kind of feel grounded or, or safe that you could play. Um, and then they don't have to ask. Because when, when you ask in that space, a lot of the time the answer is, I don't know. I don't know what I need. Normally I know what I need, but in this space, I can't even think straight, right? I can't, I can't even take a shower. I can't even make food for myself. So how am I supposed to remember what songs are helpful for me or what activities are helpful for me or even what kinds of self-care skills that I usually do every day? It, it's just you're not in the same space. You can't access your brain in the same way. Um, so having those all listed and accessible to people that you trust and people who are near you can be really, really helpful as well. And that's part of what the crisis plan, a large part of what the crisis plan really is, is explaining this is where I'm at, this is what it feels like, and here are some very tangible, practical ways to support me now. Um, and, and also, another reason why I, I feel like I'm going on a, a long time and I'm going to wrap this up, but... Um, there's a myth that suicide happens without warning and the truth is and what statistics show is that there is always signs and sometimes we miss them so if we don't know what we're looking for it's really hard to spot it which is part of the reason why I'm I'm being I know I'm being pretty direct and, and calling us out as a culture and saying why are you not spending your time your money, your energy, to prioritize knowing how to support people in this space. Because you know there are people in your life who are feeling this way, and they might need your help. I can tell you at least, um, I've had at least three people in my life tell me that I've saved their lives. And that's not about me, that's about the idea, and, and more who probably haven't told me, because we don't always tell people. And that's not about me. That's not about praising that for me. That's about the idea that you are in the same position. And I've had, I mean, 
I've had that happen with people I know, but I've had that happen with two people who I had never met before. It was the very first time I had ever met them. And I didn't even realize that they were suicidal. I just knew how to be present and how to listen non-judgmentally and how to do all of these things that we talk about in mental health first aid and, and in supporting people who are having mental health challenges. And that's all I did. And then suddenly, weeks or months later, they came back and said, dude, I was feeling suicidal until I talked to you and I realized that I needed to get help. And you can do the same thing. You and I are no different. You don't have to go get a degree in this. You don't have to decide that you want to teach mental health first aid. Just have a conversation with your family. Go take a class. Ask me a question on here. Start a dialogue. Figure out how to get some more information so that you know how to support someone. I would do anything to figure out how to support someone than risk losing them. And, and, and the myth that there isn't a sign if you have had a loved one complete suicide, it's not your fault. You do the best you can and then you learn to do better and then you do that. But the very sincere and difficult question that I'm asking you to consider is, have you done the best you can to get the information and the education that you need to be able to support somebody? Because you never know when you might be in the position to save someone's life or to make it easier. And it doesn't have to take that long. You don't have to be on call for hours and hours at a time. I spent 45 minutes with a woman who um, showed up next to my car in the front of my house who I'd never met before. I've never seen her again. I think she was having a psychotic episode, but I don't know. But when she left me, this story is heartbreaking. When she left me, I wasn't able to get her to get help. I did everything that I could, and I spent an hour, about an hour with her. Um, and I brought her to a grocery store because I wasn't sure if she had eaten, and that's, that's where I left her. And then she got out of the car. And before she got out of the car, I looked at her, and I said, Hey, I'm really glad to have spent some time with you because it it just kind of felt like she hadn't been told that in a while and so I said that to her and she looked at me and she said thank you and I offered her a hug and I gave her a hug and she got out of the car and the window was down because it was hot and she closed the door and she bent over and looked at me through the window and said I love you bye she said it really fast, like like she was kind of embarrassed, but she wanted to say it. And I just sat there, you guys, and I started crying because I thought, how long has it been since this woman was told that she was valuable to have around and that she mattered and that she was important? And God, nobody deserves that. Nobody deserves to not be told that and feel that. So even, you know... Even if it's not a mental health crisis or, or illness or whatever, if you're thinking of someone that you love and that you appreciate and that you're grateful for that has so much value, just tell them. Just text them. It takes five seconds. Give them a call. Send them a, a Marco Polo or a Voxer or a... Like, if there's nothing else that you do today, just do that start making that your practice of letting people know that they matter because you fucking matter so much and and you only know that when people remind you and you remind yourself okay um ellie says i feel so much better now but i think i need to create that crisis plan okay I, I think that everyone who has ever felt suicidal for sure should have a crisis plan um, because it just, it makes it so much easier to know that if that were to happen again, um, ultimately, if we can't take care of ourselves, then we need to have a plan in place. Like that's the best we can do. If I can't take care of myself in the moment, then I can have a plan in place to um, let other people know what I need and how to take care of me. 
Uh, so yeah, let me know if that's a training that, that you think would be helpful for you, Ellie, and hopefully a couple other people will, will chime in later on. And, um, otherwise I don't even know what I've said and what I haven't said anymore. I definitely (laughs) just showed up, uh, naked in public here in the garden and I, I, I'm so passionate about this and I I think it's such an important thing for us to be talking about. So again, if you have questions that I can support you in knowing how to support other people in understanding self-harm and understanding suicide and understanding addiction and how to support other people in in asking for support from other people, in having dialogue, in whatever it is, talking um, talking about medication with other people, how common it is, uh, creating a space for encouragement and hope and instilling that in people. Um, let me know, let's, let's have this conversation. Let me know if you wanna take a mental health first aid class. Let me know if you want me to do some more live videos and have some more discussion around it. I would love to do that. This is why I'm here um, and why I'm showing up and telling you all of these things about myself because you're not alone. And someone you know needs to know that too. Okay. I love you too, Ellie. Thanks for being here and for asking those questions. And I'll talk to you guys again soon. Bye.